Court calls case people versus Courtney Waldick. Oh, yeah. Happened with Courtney Waldick. Judge TV, uh, this is date time set for our second probable cause conference. At this time, if Waldick is inclined to waive a right to preliminary exam, and we've gone over those rights. Well, the, is that correct? You're waiving your right to a preliminary examination? Yes, Your Honor. You understand that is a proceeding where the people would have to show by probable cause that the offense alleged was committed and that you committed it? Yes, Your Honor. And you understand that you'll not have that hearing and you'll proceed to circuit court for further resolution? Yes, Your Honor. People also waive their right? Yes, Your Honor, we do. And again, that's the date I'd like to address on the appropriate time. Pardon? Yes, I do waive, but in case this affects her pretrial date, I'd like to address on the appropriate time. All right. So before I set the date, you may address my Go ahead. Your Honor, at the time my office charged this case, we requested a one hundred thousand cash surety bond. At this time, I am renewing that request. I understand that Ms. Waldick was given a fifty thousand ten percent bond at the time of her arraignment. When we were last before Your Honor, I did not have the benefit of. Uh, uh, certainly, I still don't have the because the investigation continues to be ongoing. However, the information that is now available to me has grown substantially since we were last here. Um, I will start off by going through essentially the timeline of what occurred here. In the early morning, it's January 21st, 2024, um, people that were commuting to work or other locations observed and discovered the body of Ms. Shelley Mason lying on the side of the prospect. It was unknown at the time what occurred to Ms. Mason, who killed her and who was involved, but the police were rapidly able to put together an investigation that led to them to be able to identify Ms. Walda as the person that killed Ms. Mason. On January 20th, the day of the crash, Ms. Walda had been to a uh, baby shower. She then went to Mays in Ypsilanti with her friends where she was drinking with her friends. She was texting people that were not present, somebody who was either her friend or her boyfriend. She had texted things to her boyfriend about meeting up with him later. In her text messages to her boyfriend, she indicated that she was out drinking with her friends and that she would be continuing to be drinking with her friends. She referenced to him that she wouldn't feel comfortable driving too far to meet him later. And I apologize for my language, but that she was going to be really hot up. She did drive instead though. She drove her car and she killed Miss Mason. After getting home, she, and I should say, she did stop. She did not call the police and she left the police in there. After getting home, or Ms. Waldeck saw her roommate, her roommate's name was Sarah. And notably, we now know that Sarah actually drove that same route as Courtney a couple minutes ago. And Sarah did see Ms. Mason alive and walking on the road. And Sarah to initially told the police that she saw Ms. Mason walking on the shoulder of the road, which is consistent with physical evidence in this case as well. But when Courtney got home, and this is sort of a Sarah statement, but I understand it as well as from the text messages that followed this. Courtney was quite hysterical. Courtney, excuse me, I'm going to call her Courtney. Courtney told Sarah that she had hit someone and that she needed to go back. Courtney and her roommate took over an hour to return to the scene. During this time, Courtney did not call the police. She did not ask for anybody to go out to the scene to help Miss Mason. And instead, she started texting her friends, her family. Her reaction to this was substantial and quite emotional. However, when Courtney came in for her interview with the police, which, mind you, was the Friday following, so she came in for her interview on January 26th. The crash occurred on January 20th. She told the police that she believed that she hit a deer. That this deer had just kind of popped out of nowhere that she saw it just coming at her. We know from our interview with Sarah, the roommate, that Miss Mason was walking down the road. 
Sarah saw Miss Mason a couple minutes ahead of Courtney and that Miss Mason was walking down the road. But what we also know is that Courtney didn't think she hit a deer. Sarah has now told us that Courtney came home and said, I think I hit someone. Sarah has confirmed for us that there was no mention of a deer. So when Courtney got home thinking that she hit someone without calling the police or stopping to help that someone, she continued to tell her friends and her family what she had done and what stress she had there. She didn't call the police. Leaving Miss Mason lying <coughs> in the snow on the side of Prospect in who knows what condition. And I will say that the evidence of this case bear out that it is possible that if Courtney had just called the police, Miss Mason might still be alive. That's why we have crimes like this. That's why the penalties for crimes like this are so substantial because Miss Mason may have still been alive and may still be with us right now. Miss Mason was a mother, she was a daughter, and she was a grandmother. And that woman was left on the side of the road without anybody caught, with any help being sent her way. But not only did Courtney not call the police and not attempt to save Miss Mason in any way, what, what I now know is that Courtney then deleted approximately 150 messages off of her. She deleted those messages that I referenced earlier about her not wanting to drive so far. She deleted a message about her being fucked up. And I will make clear for the record, the message says, I'm going to be fucked up, not that she currently was when she sent it. She deleted a message that said, I wish I, I, wish I would have called 911 immediately. And she also deleted, got to live with it and get my car fixed ASAP before her phone was turned over to the police. What she also did when she got home, and I know that defense counsel will argue that this was normal for her behavior, was she parked her vehicle in her garage. That garage, that car remained in the garage and the car door remained, excuse me, the garage door remained closed as far as I understand it with the garage inside. The police subsequently did a search warrant and it wasn't until they were there with the search warrant that they were then given consent to go into the garage and discover the machine. Your Honor, her guidelines as I score them are 19 months, 38 months, as I currently have them scored. My office requested a 100,000 cash surety bond at the time of charging this, and I am again renewing the request. Thank you, Your Honor. Response. Thank you, Judge. Obviously, I don't have to tell the court that Ms. Waldick uh, stands here before you innocent until proven guilty. I'm not going to try the case in front of you, but I will address some of the things that were just said. Uh, first and foremost, there was an arraignment on January 28th where, <clears throat> as Ms. Hughes indicated, their office requested a $100,000 bond. A record was made. Uh, prosecutor who attended the Zoom arraignment on that Sunday, uh, myself, each made a record and bond was set at 50,000, 10% with an alcohol tether. It's our argument to the court that that was not an unreasonable bond, unreasonable bond nor was it an abuse of discretion. Uh, the fact that there's an ongoing investigation or this was charged early, that's not my client's fault. Maybe the prosecutor's office should have waited until the investigation was complete. With that said, Ms. Hughes indicates there was some drinking going on. My client turned herself in as a person of possible interest to the Washington County Sheriff's Department to Detective Webb on January 26th. That date could have been sooner, and the police report indicates could have been sooner, but Detective Webb actually asked her to come in on Friday and not the Thursday beforehand. Uh, I appreciate Ms. Hughes said that no evidence that uh, Ms. Waldick was quote unquote fucked up, but that maybe she had said she was going to be. That talks about something in the future. It doesn't mean that she was. The same witness that Ms. Hughes talks about, and I don't think Ms. Hughes would, uh, Sarah, quote unquote, Sarah, who has come forth and said some things, is the same Sarah who said she knew nothing about this originally. So now we have two different stories from Sarah, because originally Sarah said she had no idea what happened on the date in question. Ms. Waldick is now since the arraignment and before twice here on January on February 22nd for her. 
She's been compliant with bond the whole two months to today's date that she has been on bond since being arraigned with an alcohol tether the whole time before she was released from jail with absolutely no issues. So this is the second time before you, but including going to the Sheriff's Department to speak to Detective Webb, she's appeared three times. She's not a flight risk. In addition to being on alcohol tether and having no issues, she's also reporting, checking into community corrections weekly. I've heard nothing today regarding any bond violations because I don't think there are any. There's been no change in circumstances as we see it since the date of the arraignment. Ms. Waldick is, is definitely not a flight risk, and she's not shown that she's a danger to the community in the past two months at all. Again, there's been no allegations of that. Judge, the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution indicates that the court shall provide a bail that is not excessive. Stack versus Boyle, 342 U.S. 1, and People versus Edmund, 81 Mishap, 743, says bail that is set in an amount higher than reasonably calculated to give adequate assurance that the accused will appear is excessive under the Eighth Amendment. Edmund goes on to say that courts have held that money bail is excessive if it is in an amount greater than reasonably necessary to adequately assure that the accused will appear when her presence is required. Court rules are designed to enforce these principles, Judge, and under these rules, there's a double presumption that a pretrial arrestee will be released without any case bail requirement. And that's stated in 765.6, MCLA 765.6, that in part, a person accused of a criminal offense is entitled to bail. The amount of bail shall not be excessive. Court rules go on to indicate what the money bail should be and what is required, um, and what's considered in terms of setting bond. And those things under subsection F 6.106 say a defendant's prior criminal record, she has none. Defendant's record of appearance and non-appearance or flight to avoid prosecution. She's been at everything. She's actually been at more. Well, that flight issue also includes concealment of evidence, does it? And I guess this came up at the bench when we were here on, surprisingly, on 228 or 220, our last probable cause conference date, 222, when neither party had addressed, asked to address bond, but you had mentioned it. Well, counsel, if you want to point at me, I'll tell you exactly what I know about this case. What I know about this case is the warrants came to me. That's how I knew. And that it came to me because it got a, because I'm in charge of all of these felonies and reviewing every bond that comes through. So that's how it came to me. So if you want to make dispersions against the court, go for it. Let's roll. I'm not making dispersions. I'm saying the court had asked us to approach and talked about bond. Because I'm putting everybody on notice where I am. That's why. Go ahead. You want to come at me? Let's do it. I'm making a record as to. No, go ahead and make your record. I'm just telling you where I am. In addition, and obviously we know that search warrants aren't necessarily evidence. I appreciate that you know things or allege things because you were a party to the search warrants. In addition to what I've already indicated in terms of bond, she's not a flight risk. She's appeared at every court appearance. She's gone to the sheriff's department, met with Detective Webb. She consented to a release of and a search of her phone. She doesn't have any shown history of substance abuse or addiction, a mental condition, uh, She's employed thankfully at a local hospital. She's got family members here. She's probably got about five family members here. She lives locally. She's got ties to the community. Again, bond is set at protecting the community and a flight risk. I think that she, what she has shown over the course of the past two months is she's neither. I'd ask that bond stay the same. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. The court and looking at the file until the record is clear. Council came to the bench and the court was apprising council that the court had some concerns with the bond that was set. Neither council at that time was ready to raise the bond. There were certain things that came to the court's attention that were not in the magistrate's mind, nor the magistrate's information at the time of the arraignment. I brought that to council's attention, quite frankly, out of fairness. Um, to both sides so that it could probably be argued before the court. 
what was not known to the magistrate at the time was that there was this delay. There was information that was provided to the magistrate at the time regarding the defendant turning herself in, which was somewhat confusing as to how that occurred. And I prize counsel of that. What my initial conclusion or what I saw was based upon what was presented to me prior to that hearing. Additionally, since that time, something that was not available to the magistrate were these text messages, which lead also to the defendant's knowledge, which play into this court's mind as to this defendant's danger to the public. Furthermore, there is, in terms of the issue of flight, of concealment of evidence and the like, now the deletions of text messages and other evidence um, in this case, which have just been alluded to, um, the deletion of basically evidence, which I think also bears upon um, the defendant's risk in this case. Also, the likelihood the court can take into account the likelihood of conviction and other things as it regards to setting a bond. Um, but certainly there is now clearly more information that's available to the court um, regarding this defendant, um, the offense that was committed and, and the like. Uh, the court, I will also take into account the fact that there are, I don't have any community corrections violations. I don't have anything along those lines. I do not believe that given the, the information now available to the court, that the amount of the bond that is, was originally set, I do not believe that it is appropriate. And that additional bond would be required in this case. Defendant's bond, Mr. Allen. The defendant's bond in this case will be increased. I think that the amount requested by the people was an appropriate amount. Um, quite frankly, it was appropriate, but now knowing what I know, I would actually raise it beyond that, but I will not do so um, in this case. Her bond will be increased from 50,000 cash surety to $100,000 cash surety. Are they, counsel, just for the purposes of anything, are they able to do that right now? Or we've, we've made arrangements. There's a surety bondsman in the courtroom who can do that. If you can give us 15 to 20 minutes, it'll be taken care of. She'll be taken back and do that. I think they can do that. Hold on. Sorry, guys. We need to arrange her on the information. I, apologize. I interrupted all of our proceedings. Oh, okay. okay. Yes, that's to the circuit and court. We, we'd, we'd waive the reading of the complaint uh, and have the matter set for circuit court pre-trial. I ask that she, she'd stand. She stands for you. Defendant, every way from a reading standing mute, the court will enter a not guilty plea. Pre-trial, she, well, technically, counsel just, and I'll do it for the convenience of your schedule, technically, she would be given the end date, but if it looks like you're going to post, I give the out date. So, yeah, what she, she'll be out. She'll be out. May 2nd at 1.30 before slave Thursday. Pre-trial, May 2nd, 2024, 1.30 before, that's a slay Monday. Slate Thursday. Judge, after that uh, surety is posted, can I come back with proof so that please? Thank you. 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 Thank you.